Welcome to Deepen with Pastor Joby Martin. The Church of 1122 is a movement for all people to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're praying this message helps you deepen your relationship with Him. Now let's dive in. All right, well, I'd love to welcome back my man, Pastor Britt. You know, it's good to have you back, Pastor Britt. When uh, people tell me how much they love this podcast, you are often a fan favorite. I just want you to know that. Well, thank you for those uh, two people. They have offered those comments to you. And uh, speaking of being a fan favorite, we are talking today about the approval of men, the approval of people. Do you think men would approve of the fact that Pastor Joby and I are wearing the exact same pullover jacket? It's it's the eleven twenty two swag, approve? so you know it makes sense. It don't bother me. Don't bother me none either. Yeah. If it, people knew how very little I think about what I wear, it would. And that might bother them. It's not as bad as us wearing the same outfit with with no eleven twenty two branding associated. One time, no, that's that was not good. But but we should probably tell people that we call each other in the morning. In the minute. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think? So, I mean, thank you, Pastor Joey, for the message. Incredible, and obviously struck a chord with a lot of people because there was just six rows of people on their knees just dealing with the Lord after after it was over. And I do think that it is something that everybody to some degree wrestles with. Why why is that? Well, I mean, yeah, I do too. It's, easy, it's like if I could live up to what I just preached, it'd be great. Mm-hmm. But man, you know, the human heart does not deal well when you disappoint people or people disapprove of mm-hmm. you. I mean, even people that you'd never even met, you know, mm-hmm. negative comments online, mm-hmm. those kinds of things. Um, I mean, I don't know. I guess we were created to be in a perfectly right relationship with God and one another. Mm-hmm. And when sin entered the world, it held the door open for disapproval and mm-hmm. conflict and judgment and lack of contentment, all of those things. And so, you know, it's real evident that we we are broken people that what other people think matters so much mm-hmm. to us. Especially, like, we know better. The three of us know better. But it gets me. If I was to... I thought of a couple of books I've read from not Christian authors about, about this. And oftentimes, like, a psychologist or a sociologist will say, like, well, because of your primitive ancestors had to have social acceptance by their tribe in order to survive. So this is a very natural instinct to be accepted by your peers, you know? Yeah, but they use that, they'll use the same reasoning to explain the exact opposite. And also the reason you kill somebody is because of the primitive, I mean, Mm -hmm. bro, when you just decide that's the paradigm by which everything is, you know, if you got on rose colored glasses, guess what everything looks Mm -hmm. like? Right. So I'm not buying it. There's something there, good about harmony, though, right? And so there is... I think we have been created as image bearers of God, right. and God is in right relationship, relationship with himself, so when we're not, something's off. Mm-hmm. And though I shouldn't care about what you think, I do. Like, something's off when you disapprove of me, particularly, and especially in this world. You know, we talk a lot about social media and smartphones and <clears throat> some real damning s- statistics, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, just heartbreaking. Um. And and I don't know, the approval of man. Because here's the thing. When I care a lot about what you think, I lose sight of what God thinks about me mm-hmm. through the gospel. Hmm. What were you sure. saying? They're interconnected issues. There's in the same lane, however you want to look at it. Your original question was, why do you think that is? We've talked about this before. But what happened at the fall when sin entered the world is that Adam and Eve became aware of themselves. They ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so what happened was they became subject to moral construct and discerning and deciding for themselves what was right and what was wrong, what was good and what was evil. So they, they became self-aware. They, 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 got a con- they became conscientious. And 
before that, they had no regard for themselves. It wasn't that they thought lowly of themselves or they thought highly. They just didn't think of themselves. Yeah, they, they were, were in, naked and unashamed. Naked and unashamed. Like, that means vulnerable, transparent. They they didn't look at themselves and go, ugh. They, you know? right. right. They were in right relationship with God, and God's opinion and love and provision is all that they cared about. It was mm. all that they had, and it was more than enough. Then sin fractures that... And they become self-aware and begin to compare themselves to each other and look and they begin to cover. And that next leads to Cain and Abel, which covering quickly led to killing. And this is what happens when you're the center of your own narrative is you're just going to head down a, a road that's completely unsatisfying. So now we live in a world where we have the, it's the theological now and not yet, where we have this freedom that has been purchased for us by Jesus Christ that we don't have to live as slaves to our own thoughts about ourselves. Because the reason I really care what Pastor Joby thinks about me is because I am constantly thinking about me and I need someone to reinforce me. I need someone to tell me I'm right or I'm wrong to help me validate my emotions and to help me validate my sense of self. Right. And so I look to you to validate what I want to think is true about me. And and oftentimes, I don't even know what to think about myself, but I can't help thinking about myself. Look at the slave to digital empire. So mm -hmm. often, we're on there trying to decide for ourselves what should we actually think about ourselves. Or we're so tired of thinking about ourselves, we go to digital devices to numb our minds from the slavery of self-bondage. And so it's a very complex issue on one hand, but on the other hand, we celebrate the, the freedom and somehow, oh, the interconnected lanes. Paul is not merely, as you so well articulated, he is not merely just talking about, why do I care so much about how you feel about me? He is saying, I don't care more about what you think about me than I do about what you think rightly about the gospel. Correct. So what matters more to me is that you believe on Jesus in his name, regardless of how you feel about me. Because mm -hmm. it goes on to say in 1 Corinthians, well, I'll stop there. There is a positive aspect of the approval of man. Um, be, like, I care what y'all think about me in regards to like accountability or... I know that you love me and you're for me, so if you saw an area of my life where I had a log in my eye or a speck in my eye, I would want you to say, we disapprove of this, mm -hmm. and that matters. So your opinion in that regards matters. So it's not just like, I don't care what you think. That's not what Paul's saying. Mm -hmm. uh, first, first Corinthians 4, he says, um, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you. So it is a thing. So... Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. So the Galatians, he, he's saying, I'm not going to let what you think about me keep me from telling you the truth in a very hard way. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but being in right relationships with one another, with people that love Jesus and are pointing you to Jesus, like what they think does matter in regards to pointing you to Jesus. Well, that's why he writes what he writes in the letter to the Corinthians, because in verse 10, he goes on to say, I make it my aim to please everyone, whether they be Jew or Greek, so that yeah. they may be saved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so whether I want you to think good of me so that you would be saved. I don't care if you think bad at me. Right. If what I'm articulating to, to you is for your salvation's sake. So there's something more important than your opinion, which is that you would be saved and believe on the right gospel, not a different gospel that he's contending against here in mm -hmm. Galatians. Mm -hmm. You really see if you believe this, if there's like, <clears throat> I guess this is kind of depending on your level of influence or whatever, mm -hmm. but let some people come after you and question your motives or say things about you that aren't true or, the worst. It, you know, and in that moment, mm -hmm. am I now trying to win the approval of man or of God? Mm-hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not... <clears throat> I like the, the, clear, the clarity there because it's not that you just have permission to not care at all ever. 
You know, it's not like, hey, this is a, a verse that gives me permission to just go do whatever I want and <clears throat> never think about anybody else at all. But in the perspec- uh, perspective matters and proportionality matters. Like, if I make your voice or anybody, well, actually, the people listening to this podcast is a better example. Mm-hmm. If I care, if I listen too much to what they think, mm-hmm. then it mm-hmm. tends to tune down mm-hmm. what I know God mm-hmm. thinks about me. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's really good. Like, I'm thinking of an exercise. Let's just say somebody could do this exercise where they, you know, you write down 10 names or or something like that, a list of different people or even groups, and then rate from one to 10, like how important is that person's opinion yeah. for me? And if you could if you could actually be honest enough, you might be able to spot like, you know, Ted down the street from me weighs number nine, a nine out of 10, because, you know, and they would it would not make sense. Like it makes sense that people that you care a lot about would have, or that you've given permission to speak into your life, that they would have a high number, but... If it's just some random strangers or the the audience I care so much about, it exposes the the purport, disproportionality. I think yeah. of what you're saying. I think one what I was trying to articulate earlier in regards to the pursuit of the approval of man being rooted in our truly our sense of self. So it's a good example that you bring up because let's just say you're preaching. And when you get a response, you just inherently get a dopamine hit. It just is what it is. And so you can chase that, right? Or you can Mm. use humor or use passion or use, not use, but you can lean into those things for the sake of the gospel or for the sake of the dopamine hit, right? Mm. And we know that because we all preach and teach and lead different things, um, but it's really, but ultimately we're not after your applause so that you would think well of us. We're after a feeling inside of us mm-hmm. that you provide for us through your, you right? And so this is true on social media. This is true in email. This is true in, in all the things. And that's why it hurts so bad when there's one, you have an assessment of me that I don't agree with and I want to defend myself and I want to, somebody posts on YouTube or whatever, and I want to argue or fight back, or you say something that actually validates the negative emotions I have about myself. Mm -hmm. And that hurts just as bad. Mm -hmm. Um, And what Paul is is saying is, he's just reminding us, because I think he felt all these feels too. I don't think he wanted to be mad at the Galatians. Mm -hmm. I don't think he wanted to feel any sense of rejection Mm -hmm. from the Galatians. Mm -hmm. And that said, he had to work through something he wanted more. Right. And we have to do that in our interpersonal relationships and in our responsibilities. Yeah, Paul's not, I mean, Jesus, Jesus, fully God, fully man, so still struggled with human desires or whatever. But anytime I read something like this from Paul, I don't think it was like without effort on his part. Like I think that when he says it, I think he's telling this to himself too, or it's it's like it's well-earned the position that he's in. Somehow he's gotten to a place where he's like, I'm not trying to please you, but I don't think it came cheaply because well, it, would, it wouldn't come for anybody, right? A verse I go to and unpack is, you know, in Philippians 4, he says, I've learned the secret of being mm-hmm. content. Well, there's it's, it's he learned it. He didn't inherit it. Right. It wasn't just like God didn't just sprinkle contentment dust on him. So he had to learn a thing. Mm-hmm. And it, it wasn't necessarily obvious. You know, it's a lot of the countercultural uh, narrative of the gospel to find your life, you got to lose it. Mm-hmm. First will be last, all of that upside down kingdom stuff. And he was proud. He talks about how proud he was of, of his own accomplishments and how he was trying to be somebody. When he, whenever he tells, like, this is who I was, like, he's like, and I was proud of it. So for him to say the things that he says later, and they just land that that much stronger. Well, this past week we were at a pastor's conference out in Dallas, and it was cool. So cool. And But one of the things you said in one of the sessions, you may have just said it off the cuff, but you said, 
you said that as the lead pastor and the primary preacher at our church, you don't ever ask people who work for you, what do you think about the sermon? I try not to. When I find to. myself doing it, I'm like, because what are they going to say? What are you going to say? That wasn't your best. <laughs> like, now it'd be different if we had an if we had an, an eval meeting, you know, and we were like evaluating the service and people had input. But that is just nothing but fishing for applause. Yeah. That is all that is. Mm-hmm. And I think that is I think that's great for you to operate from that conviction. But you know, I could go find podcasts where preachers are like, you should have a feedback team and you should da 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 da. And maybe somebody should, and maybe you shouldn't, right? And so that's like you've made that choice, and I think it's a great one. And it just so happens that you're like one of the foremost experts in the world on preaching. And so for anybody else to be like, hey, you know, you're kind of- like your self-evaluation will be way better than the feedback that we would give anyway. But I think you're a bit of a unicorn in that. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I'm walking out of my office, and there's – Two Nehemiah and, yeah. guys volunteering and my assistants and a tech person. And I go, what would y'all think about that? <laughs> Dude, I am just, I am fishing for the applause of man. Mm-hmm. And I, I have caught myself doing that, and I go, you cannot do that. Mm-hmm. You cannot do it. Mm-hmm. Now, I do think you can ask up, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like, I could ask the elders, hey, what would y'all think? Mm-hmm. You know? Um. So I bring it up as a personal example because I think we all need checks and balances in our life in this area mm-hmm. where we yeah. catch ourselves fishing for the applause of man or that that feedback loop to mm-hmm. feed that sense of ego and yep. self. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think you've found it and you and you walk in it really really well and I think it's so connected to our mental health and our emotional health and all of these things are so deeply connected that that finding checks and balances and because it's not just the lights on the dashboard. It's one thing for me to have a light that goes off that goes, man, I'm feeling anxiety in my stomach or I'm feeling <clears throat> my body's feeling tense and I know that it's rooted in interpersonal tension or at least perceived interpersonal tension. That's one thing. You should pay attention to that. It's another thing to put a check in your check and balance on that to go, now where am I going to go? Mm-hmm. Once I feel the sense of rejection or I feel the need for affirmation from man's approval, I then have to say, well, what am I going to do about that? Am I, it's not enough to just know. I have to then, yep. like, and I can t- put my wife in a terrible, terrible. position sometimes, like, mm-hmm. where... I go looking for her. I go, and it it sounds like what I'm looking for is honest dialogue, but what I'm actually looking for is applause, applause and approval and encouragement. And then I'm only setting her up to lose. So G and I have a deal, okay? Um, if she has correction, which she is more than welcome to give, then you don't do it until Saturday. Like, give me Friday. Like, give me a good 12 hours. Like, don't, like, if I, if she comes on Thursday night, I do not want to hear what I could be doing better. All I want to hear from her is Hercules, Hercules. So, I, so she's really, she's good at that too. But, you know, mm-hmm. like, by the time this comes out, Sunday will have happened. I don't know if the biscuit comment is going to make it on Sunday or not. We shall see. But she, if she was here tonight on Saturday, she'd be like, I don't think I'd say that, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know who I do ask when he's here? My dad. Mm. But that's a legitimate, like the approval from your father for what you do. I don't care. I'm 50 years old. When my daddy tells me good job, it means, I mean, his words just weighed 10 million pounds. Mm-hmm. But that's how God has rightly ordered the cosmos. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like wanting to make your dad proud mm-hmm. in line with obedience to Christ, I think is a legitimate thing. Asking your assistant who you pay and do their annual eval, what would you think about that? These are not the same thing. Mm. You know what I mean? I read a great book called Thanks for the Feedback, and they say there's just different kinds of feedback and that it really helps anybody who you're having a feedback conversation with, it really helps to clarify. Like there's feedback for encouragement and there's feedback for critique. Yep. And so 
if what you really want is encouragement and the person thinks you really want critique, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to, you're going to miss. Um, oh yeah. I thought, I thought about Tim Keller's core idols, like the deep idols, right? What's he called? Deep or, yeah, I think it's- um, and, and their, their comfort control approval. Am I missing any? I mean, at least those power. are them. Power. Yeah, power. I think power and control may be the same. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's true. But obviously, approval is one of it. So let's talk a little bit about idolatry and this struggle. Like, how does idolatry... He, Paul doesn't specifically call him out for idolatry there, but how does that play into it? Well, in you know, I didn't want to make the whole thing about preaching, but Paul specifically is talking about preaching, so what I do like maybe 10 or 15 minutes on that before we shift it into like, how does this just apply to like your own life? But anytime you begin to try to use the Lord to make something of you, mm-hmm. it is the worst of all idolatry. Uh, like go back to the one initiative. What you're doing when you do that is you're the one and you're trying to use him as a means to your end. When you, especially, man, you try to do ministry, you do use ministry, you know, for your own namesake. It's really, really sick. And all of us, present company included, are like wired to do it that way. Like we are. We all just got back from the big conference, man. It feels good when everybody tells you great job and. Britt and I are like, this is the weirdest thing ever because just a few years, we're just sitting on the back row, learn, you know, with our notebooks out, taking notes. And now we led, I felt like we led everything. <laughs> and it's a weird thing. And it feels really good when everybody says, great job. So you just got to pay very, very close attention to that, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And I mentioned this tonight, man, how good is God that in light of that conference and meeting, Dr. John Piper, and hanging out with, you know, some of my buddies like Brian Loritz, Matt Chandler, and their opinion of me matters, man. They're some of the best preachers on the planet. So it's kind of a thing. When I'm preaching and there's Matt Chandler sitting in the fourth row, like, cheering you on, it's a thing, man. It's just a thing. It's not a random person. And how good is God that I am marinating in this text all week long, Mm -hmm. all week long. I mean, that's how good God is to us. Mm -hmm. Like in that particular instance, he he orchestrated it so that I would be keenly aware, Mm -hmm. even like when Matt was preaching in the final session, dude, he, it was so good. Oh my gosh. We should just show that to staff. Um, you know, he mentioned me a couple times, and I have to be like, why does that feel so rewarding? You know, you just you want to receive it humbly mm-hmm. and then just let that thing go immediately. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like when people encourage you, you want to be a receiver of encouragement. Mm-hmm. It's like you, you bring this up all the time when HB was sitting in that chair and said something like, <clears throat> The pastors I meet are not drunk on compliments. They're starving for encouragement. That I think that's very true. So when people say nice things, I find the best thing to say, I don't even agree with them. I don't if they say that was a great sermon, I just I'll just say thank you for saying that. Cuz that's exactly what I mean. Mm. I I don't I don't I don't even just say, I don't even just say thank you cuz that's kind of like, yep, it was. Mm. You're welcome. I don't say that. I just say Thank you for saying, or thank you for the kind words. Mm-hmm. Because the Bible says we're supposed to encourage one another. Yeah. And you brought this up. You brought this up in one of the sessions. We've talked about this before. Nowhere in the Bible does it command us to humble one another. That's between you and the Lord. Mm-hmm. Now, if you saw me being arrogant out of love, you should say, hey, man, I see some stuff. But humble is a posture. So to withhold encouragement because mm-hmm. you're trying to, you know, people will say this, well, I don't want to give you a big head. Be like, bro, just either encourage or don't, but don't do that thing, mm-hmm. you know? You laid this out in the message to about idolatry, that when you are expecting, when you try to get from people what you should only get from God, that's, that's the definition of worshiping an idol. It's just like, oh, I'm going to look to that thing to give me the thing that only God can give me. 
Dude, and this a, is a big one. It's a weight they can't bear. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what <clears throat> I was talking to Chandler about. He, he was talking to me about a sermon that sermon series that he's doing right now, and he was talking. He was talking about like romance and marriage, but the, it, it goes much bigger than that. And he's like, there's there's kind of two different ways to do marriage, and one is like this biblical covenantal love and respect, mm-hmm. serve and and support, you know, and. Christ is in the middle, and we love him the most, and this is a picture of that kind of love. The other is you begin to heap upon your spouse all of your wants and needs and expect them to meet them romantically. And he says that is like a tick on a dog. Mm -hmm. That is not a marriage. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, and if you get two people to do it, you just got two ticks and no dog. Mm -hmm. And that's... Well, the same thing can be true in a friendship, a working relationship. Yeah. You could put that kind of pressure like on your disciple group leader, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. You could be as trivial as to put that on an Instagram post. Totally. That yeah. you, you put an Instagram post out there looking for the the f- you're trying to to more, in this illustration suck blood out of the digital wherever mm-hmm. and because you're just a tick on that as your object. And that's really tough, man. I think your question about idolatry, Keller goes on to say, and I'm going to misquote it, but some version of you you know how to figure out what your idols are. Your question was a why idols. Mm-hmm. Like yours was like a deeper, where does the idol come from? But for, to find where they come from, you've got to find out what they are or what the symptoms of them are. Mm-hmm. He says, so in order to start identifying symptoms or what idols could be in your life, is is anything that if I took it away from you caused irreparable damage? Mm-hmm. If it if it went away, would it cause irreparable damage? That's how you know yep. what what an idol is. Your mind should go to like the rich young ruler. He's like, you only like one thing. But he, the rich young ruler couldn't even imagine a life without his riches. And so he goes away sad. Mm -hmm. So that was the one thing that drove everything in his life. Mm. You know, uh, you mentioned the Instagram thing or the social media thing. I have two teenage kids, and there are crowds of them at my house all the time, you know. And I have heard them, not my, like the the crowds of friends having beef with one another because they'll say, you didn't like my post. What a, so that's now the currency of relationship for a 16-year-old. I don't have a 16-year-old, so mm-hmm. I'm not naming either one. But that's it. Like, I posted a thing, and my expectation is, because we're friends, you have X amount of minutes to comment, like, repost, or you are letting me down. Mm. Yeah. That is, a, that, that is a miserable way to live your life I need, on both ends of that. For sure. I need to discuss this more with my wife, but I'm just going to put it out there on the internet for kicks and giggles. But (laughs) I have, I I don't have a lot of money. God is, we're fine, right? But I'm I'm not like rich or or anything even close. That said, I am going to offer both of my children what feels like to me a significant sum of money to hold off on anything social media until they're 16 and it will be even more if you hold off until you're 18 and That's smart we'll see what they do and I may not give them the choice until they're 16 you know what I mean the law may not give them the choice <laughs> until they're 16 if things keep going the way yeah, that would going. be helpful so that about, would be helpful you know I read you thank thank you you gave me a bunch of the books to you know on this stuff and so I had a team of people help me, like, kind of pull out a bunch of the stats and stuff I shared. And then, um, man, I wish I could – I don't. I can't remember the guy's name, but Ben Stewart gave me a YouTube thing to watch of a guy that's an atheist, but he, but he's a, a, an educator, and it's just all of the impact of social media, whatever. Mm-hmm. So he basically says, whatever you do, don't, don't do social media at least until you're 14, like at least until high school. Um, and then – it was that if you, if you can wait till sixteen, all the science is it's even way better. So I wish I'd have had that years ago. Yeah, I mean you can only do with you got what you got with what you know. 
you know. It's also very different. Like, you know, my son is, doesn't, he's not a big, you know, all he does is watch UFC clips, <laughs> people beating each other's brains in. And then, but, you know, but my daughter, it's a thing, man. It's a thing. It's such a weird, so I had this random occurrence. We're talking about social media. I was walking through this crowd of people and these two people said, oh, hey, you know, I, I didn't know you were whatever going here. And uh, they started to, somehow I caught enough of the conversation to hear somebody say, uh, one person said, yeah, well, I've just been traveling. And the other person was just like, yeah, I saw all the posts that you went to, so, so, you know. Mm -hmm. So they basically knew these details about their life, not ha not from being told. Right, yeah. But it's just from the announcements that are going out about your life on. It's a new day. It's so wild. It's strange. And, it, and it's a total, before, I'm not just going to slam it. Because, like, what's, what's hilarious, I could slam it right now. And everybody listening on their phone while they're scrolling is like, yeah, you tell them, Pastor. So it's a social experiment. And we have no idea mm. what the outcome is going to be. So far, it's not looking good. Mm-hmm. It's really not looking good. I mean, think about this. What are your favorite memories as a kid? They're all outside, aren't they? That's and right. they're all with people. Mm. In 2010, play childhood ended and screen childhood began. Mm. And fear rose. Everything. And everything rose. Mm. And anxiety. Here's what's crazy. Okay, so here's what's crazy about it too. So like there's more... There, there's way more um, breast cancer screening, treatment, doctors, yada, 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 all the things. And intuitively, it makes sense. There's a lot less people dying of breast cancer. I'm not minimizing it. I'm saying people put a lot of money, time, effort, energy, focus there, and the results are really, really positive, okay? Mm -hmm. There are more children in therapy now. There are more drugs to pre to to treat depression, anxiety, and there's the opposite effect has taken. There's not way less. You would think, well, if it's working, everybody should be better. But we're way worse than we've ever been ever, 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 ever. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And it ain't good. The enemy, the enemy, it's almost like it, the enemy took all of his strategies and tactics and manifest them into a digital device. And so now the age old temptation of overvalue petty things is in your hand, on my hand, all the time. The age old temptation to care way too much about earthly things and not near enough mm. about heavenly things mm. is at my fingertips all the time. And it's like there's. I'm working this out as I go here, but it's like there's it's the pendulum thing. Like on one side, someone may argue that ignorance is bliss, but in the world we live in, we have far that that we've learned that's not necessarily true. There are, were a lot of things that were true when I was a teen, when I was young, eight, ten years old, like where dangerous people lived mm -hmm. or uh, where are places that I should avoid or information that I can now freely get was really, really hard to get to be truly informed about a topic to make a wise decision, okay? So ignorance is not bliss. But on the other side of that pendulum is omnipotence or is more than I can bear or omniscience, being all-knowing. Yeah. Omniscience is, is more than I can handle. Yeah. And no matter how hard I try to feed the information or the connectivity beast, at some point, there's there's just too much information for me me to be able to bear. That's not a chair that I can sit in. Mm. And it feels that we're stuck in between these two things now where we know that ignorance is not complete bliss, that there is a power of wisdom that comes with access to knowledge mm. and information. And there's a speed of... Like you and I, I don't know that we can serve our church that God's called us to better, Vinky, because we can communicate faster, but we can certainly communicate faster and be more efficient in our heart to serve our church. 
So I would say that that's probably a pro. Well, there's some serious pros like the new app that we just put out, and there's daily habits, and we can be praying for one another. And, man, the number of people that have communicated with us via email because they saw a sermon clip that led them to listen to a sermon that led them to Christ. So it's all it's a lot of lights and shadows. It's You know, if you think, like, if you think of, like, the Tower of Babel, <clears throat> So, so, so there's a tool that God allows humanity to receive by his common grace where they could build stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So they don't have to live in fig leaf houses. They can build buildings now. It's good. Mm-hmm. And then they, they leverage that good gift of God to try to overtake God primarily to reach him, to see everything and know everything. And it's... You get some real connections to what people feel like with a mm-hmm. smartphone in their pocket. Mm-hmm. It's a tool, and it's it's in a very limited way. There's like this omnipresence. You're everywhere all the time via pictures. There's this omniscience. You're one search away from knowing whatever you want to know about all the time. Mm-hmm. And you know random things about people that you would likewise not know. Mm-hmm. So we're going to talk a little bit specifically about social media, but when you were talking, I thought of an analogy, okay? Like you said, the enemy, it's the age-old things all brought into this package. And so maybe a helpful way to think about it is it's a delivery system for something that's always been there. So it's not new. Like the desire to envy, uh, envy or lust or Agree. All this, all these things, they've always been desires that spring up in the heart. But what the enemy did was find a delivery system that's like a super highway, and it made me think about, you know, how our bodies are wired for tastes, right? Like you like sweet things, you like things with fat, you like things with salt or whatever. And many people would say you know, t- that today, food companies, or whatever, have learned to like over amplify and super highway. Nutri- like all those things that your body craves and loves and that gets you into all kinds of problems. Yeah, and they and they intentionally make them addictive. For sure. Just like the, I mean, bro, just like your social media is is giving you the things that they know or it knows will addict you. Yeah, so it's a super highway delivery That's, system yeah. for those things that are have already been there. But w- maybe break comparison out of that, like, why is comparison so deadly with or without social media? I mean, you had, you had a few great lines about it, Pastor Joby, which I'll say, but you answer first. Well, I mean, comparison kills because it's always lose-lose. Mm-hmm. Like either think too highly of yourself or you don't, you don't know that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. So pride nor condemnation is the language or the tone of voice of the Father. Mm -hmm. And that's where it always leads, right? Mm. You envy up and disdain down. Mm -hmm. That ain't good. It can't be good. You said comparison strangles contentment. I thought that was such a great I should write that down. (laughs) Comparison strangles. It's a great image. Chokes it. Chokes it out. You ever see that? Every office space at some point 25 years ago had that picture of that stork eating the frog, but the frog was strangling. That's what was in my mind. Uh-huh. You know, because you're like, ooh, I'm consuming this. And you're like, that's actually killing me. Right. So uh, when Jesus tells the parable about the sower sowing the word of God, the one that was about the cares of the world mm-hmm. and riches and all that kind of stuff, he says that it choked out the word so that it wouldn't become effective uh, or wouldn't bear fruit. You also you also gave a great image about when you're when you're trying to please others, it's like handing the keys of your contentment to other people. Man, that was good. I want to ask a question though, like there's a lot of ways you can do that. Mm-hmm. So I thought of a person who like have you ever just like had another person in your life that was like annoying? And you're just like, man. And no, so I'm, not, I'm never, you know, I've read about it. So, <laughs> yeah. so in a sense, you're giving that person power over you, like the keys to your contentment. So maybe it's not about approval, but something about them has control over you. Is that the same thing as, as approval of man in a weird, and like the, 
the backwards way? Like, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, it is. I mean, I mean, just think about it in our life, okay? So, you you know, you're like, all right, well, I'll, I will be content when my kids act right, when my wife has the respect that I deserve, mm-hmm. when all my employees do exactly what they're supposed to do, and when my boss treats me the way, mm-hmm. you know? And when everybody gets it right, there'll be three seconds one day in June. And I'm like, ah. Oh. <laughs> but we live in a broken world, man. Mm. You know, it ain't. It's just not gonna happen. You gotta snatch that back and be like, if Lord, like man, the song. What's the first song we sang? I am who you say I am. Mm-hmm. That's it, bro. Like we, you gotta snatch him back mm-hmm. and just consistently give them to the Lord mm. and say, I am who I'm. Who you say that I am? Mm. I appreciate my relationships with all these people, but my validation does not come. From even from my children and wife, or my boss, or the people that I work with, or any of those sort of things. And you talk about that so often. Like, if you put your hope in your circumstances, it will never, it will never satisfy you because circumstances are always changing. Like, and and it will corrupt your character. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, there are things that you know that you're supposed to say no to, but you're on that business trip, mm-hmm. and your boss says, "Let's go to this place." And you're thinking, I shouldn't go to that place. My wife wouldn't want me to go to my, this place. I would be embarrassed if my children knew that I'd go to this place. Mm. But this man's approval matters. Mm. And in that moment, he is your God mm. because you think he promotes. Mm-hmm. The Bible says only God can promote. Like see Joseph in front of the Pharaoh, mm-hmm. right? Right. When he was like, I hear you can interpret dreams. He's like, nope, but my God can. That That's ultimate, like, God tells me who I am. Mm-hmm. Dude, he could have gone right back to jail. He ends up being senior VP. Mm-hmm. It's cool. Yeah, That's what I'm talking about, mm-hmm. right? Or you're in a dating relationship, mm-hmm. and this guy is great, and the girl is insecure, and he's... And nobody, I don't think anybody would actually say this. Maybe they would. Maybe they're just the worst people, and I haven't been around people like this in a minute at least talking like this. And he's basically saying, if you don't give me what I want, then we're breaking up. And she she has convictions and there's, she, there's shame and guilt. And in that moment, his approval matters more than what God says is right and true. Mm-hmm. And you're, it's a trap. I mean, that's what, that's what, uh, was it Proverbs? Yeah, Proverbs 29, 25. Yeah, the fear of man is a snare or a trap. Mm. You're like, no, this will work out. Yeah. And it killed you. Yeah. And here's the thing. This is not a teenage thing, man. Mm. Like, what's crazy to me, you know, we talk about peer pressure all the time when I was doing student ministry to eighth graders. Mm-hmm. As if every 50-year-old didn't still act like an eighth grader at the golf course. Right. You know? Yeah. Like, I'm just trying to keep up and win the approval of this group. It comes in it comes in all shapes and forms, you know. Somebody makes a joke that you shouldn't laugh at and you think, well, I can't be that person, so I'm not going to so I'll laugh I'll laugh along with it. You're you're some one of your friends says, "Hey, let's go to this one place." And you're like, "Yeah, not in the budget, but you're like, I'm going to go there anyway." And just because you don't want to be the one person to say. So part of the reason that like he who walks with the wise grows wise. Mm-hmm. So it can work the opposite way too. You get around a bunch of people. Oh yeah. Like I'm a, I promise you this. If you become my friend and hang out in my inner circle and you don't become a better, more loving husband, we will kick you out of our group. Mm. You don't get to make fun of your wife. You don't get to be crappy to her in front of us. Mm-hmm. When I am, they're like, dude. Like, dude, Jeff Cop will pull me aside and be like, Hey man, getting a little short. I'm like, Kuh. so it can work in the positive too. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and he's doing he's doing the Galatians one ten thing mm-hmm. for am I trying to win your approval or God's approval? And I know you're my pastor and blah 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 blah. But first and foremost, you've invited me into this and dude, tighten it up. Mm. And if I don't conform to that godly pattern of my buddies loving their wife, I'm in trouble. Mm-hmm. So it can work really good too. Or a group of guys going, what do you mean you're not going to church? You know what I mean? And you don't even want to go, but you go, mm-hmm. and it so you can leverage. Yeah. These things in a really positive way. You had so you had a couple of great things about victims, you know, and literally the definition of being a victim is that the, pa- the all the power belongs to somebody else. And so in your mind, you, you're like, well, I have no, 
I have no power because all the power I've, I've given to everybody else, my circumstances, my boss, the people, you know, all this, all these different things. So how do you take back, like when you say, no, no, I'm, I don't have to be, like, I don't have to put my contentment into everybody else's hands. We said, we said circumstances change all the time. Well, put your, the keys of your contentment in the thing that's not going to change ever. Correct. My my big problem with this everybody claiming to be uh, victimized by some kind of power play is it actually diminishes the real cries of real victims. Mm -hmm. You know? That's right. There are people that get victimized. Mm -hmm. but, but somebody, a professor or a boss or a preacher, mm -hmm. saying something that you disagree with or that hurts your feelings is not victimizing. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's just disagreement. Mm -hmm. And if you're a believer, you should pay close attention to that. Because yeah. if you're really upset and you're really, really hurt, it actually could be the conviction of the Holy Spirit because you, it's it's a road you need to walk down. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I, you know, I've had people really mad at me because I taught what the Bible said on a topic. Mm -hmm. They're not actually mad at me. They're just, they're mad because that's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. How do we unpack that a little bit, Pastor Britt, because it's important to know how we as a, how, how the culture is getting to a place where the hurt feelings are actually being interpreted as, oh, you're harming me. No, it's called violence these days. Oh yeah. Like it's, it's being called like violence. You're doing violence. That's not what that word means. Yeah. Like we've talked about this before, bro. It's the same word as new dictionary. I'm telling you, the, the 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 current university situation is abysmal. Mm. <clears throat> I mean, every therapist will tell you the way you get over fear is voluntarily exposing yourself to the things that you dislike mm -hmm. step by step. It's got to be voluntary. Mm -hmm. And the university system is treating 20-year-olds like two-year-olds, mm -hmm. keeping them in their playpen safe and then wondering why they are completely ill-equipped mm -hmm. to go to work. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not good, man. Mm -hmm. And here's what's crazy. Here's how we know it's a product of environment. You could take the same people and put them in the Marines and they would storm Normandy. Mm -hmm. Like, people rise up to what you have to do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I don't have m much to add to it. The at the end of the day, there is gospel, and God's kingdom, and then there are all the different many ways of this world. And in this world, when people are the point and they are fighting to be the point of everything and trying to find themselves in light of only nothing everywhere like everything is ultimately meaningless mm -hmm. if you are not a part of the kingdom of god then you begin to ascribe an inordinate amounts of meaning to places that are just meaningless and it all comes down to the reality that you do not know who you are mm. and more importantly you just don't mm. yet know whose you are and and so i used to get real judgy and fighty listening to podcasts and philosophers and social thinkers on this issue. And now I just get really heartbroken. You know, I just, I probably still get a little judgy and fighty, but I just get so heartbroken because yeah, it's so like, judgy, fighty stage. Little yeah, judgy, I mean, it really is so sad, man, because yeah. it's like, if not for God's grace, so go I, you know, I, I, I would be having meaningful, meaningless, worthless conversations about, how we're all how I think you should think, mm -hmm. and I'm so glad to have the authority of God's word, so that it's not left up to me to how you should think. When you begin to move away from like objective reality, which Piper said God is reality, oh. He's not even ultimate reality. He is. There is nothing without Him which makes Him reality. Okay. So when you begin to move away from that, you also begin to move away from things like right and wrong, light and dark. Mm -hmm love and wickedness, mm -hmm. you know? So then everything just becomes subjective to your current feelings. And that is what now tries to determine 
from a completely twisted and subjective way what you call objective reality. Mm. So you can declare you are whatever you want to be, even though the objective reality is not that at all. And you can call evil good and good evil. And the Bible says, whoa, Mm. when that happens. That's full circle back to the garden. That's exactly what I was talking about at the beginning. What Adam and Eve brought upon themselves in the fall was ex- exactly what you just talked about was a they became aware of their feelings and their feelings then became the deciding mm. impulse by which to judge the rest of the world including themselves mm. that is what it means the tree of the knowledge of good and evil they now have the ability to feel to discern and to decide However, it's massively limited because it's self-focused. And so what fell was instead of everything being God-focused and being God-filtered and being unconditionally wrapped in unconditional love, everything became me-focused and me-filtered and vain pursuit. And so that, that has played itself out over all these generations. And here we are still using our feelings to discern and decide what life is and what reality is and how we're supposed to live in it. And it was just never, you know, I don't say it's never supposed to be this way. God is a better way. There is a better way. Mm. and But it's only found in and through Christ Jesus, which is what Paul's saying. He's saying, I don't care what you think about me. Believe in Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's better. It's better, and don't don't turn your back on the gospel. One of the things that I was thinking about a minute ago is when you get down to the motivational level, the symptom is social media. We talk about that, mm-hmm. or the symptom is the approval of man through the means of social media. That would be a symptom. But there's kind of four. There may be more categories, but there's four categories of motivation in regards to seeking after the approval of man. And so I will ask myself, which of these four am I in? One is, I'm going to make this decision or I'm going to do this thing because I care what others think about me. The second motivation would be, I care what I think about me. And so I'm going to go and try to figure out if I'm right. Those may be connected. The third one is, I care what I think about you. That one's interesting to me. Because there's a lot of people who spend a lot of time trolling and strolling a lot of information and a lot of other people's lives, and they would say, I don't care what they think about me. I don't even really post nothing. I don't really, you know, I just kind of have it. Why? And I'm not saying it's inherently bad to have it or anything, but I'm saying ask that on the motivational level. I think some folks would say it's because actually I, I, I like – to get all the stuff in my brain riled up in the direction of other people. So I, what I care about is what I think about you because somehow it makes me feel a thing about me. Mm. Even though I'm not directly seeking your approval, by looking at your life and reading about this and maybe getting a little judgy, maybe get, it does something in me to have strong thoughts or, or what I feel are informed thoughts about you. That's a serious thing to pay attention to. I confess my favorite thing to watch, like YouTube shorts where somebody that believes politically, morally, theologically like I do, just roast somebody. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Dude, I mean, I love it so much. <laughs> That's it. Like I'm not I don't know these people. I don't even want to meet them. I don't I'm not, you know, I'm not I'm not comparing my life to them. It's a different category. Makes you feel some some kind of way. It's the same as it makes I have a similar feeling as to when I watch a clip of Georgia throwing a touchdown or my favorite MMA fighter knocking somebody out. <laughs> They're all in the same category. <laughs> yeah, it's you, like we won. You somehow feel like you're winning. That's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. And you feel validated in your opinions yeah. and you get down. That makes you feel a certain way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The last one, the most dangerous to me, is probably the person who's the person who would say, I don't care what I think about. So there's, I care what you think about me. I care what I think about you. Uh, I care what I think about me. 
Yeah, you get what I'm saying. But the last one is the person who just mindlessly or brainlessly would just say, I don't even really care what I think about. Mm. And it's the it's the not that I don't have anything to do, it's that I don't know what to do with myself conversation. Mm. And so I just go to what's there Mm. because I don't what you're saying when you're just mindlessly surfing when i'm mindlessly surfing i don't have any social media so or I'm not, endlessly play a video game or binge watch a show right. forever i can read news and it, articles mm-hmm. and uh, for days and days and days and days and days mm-hmm. and it's all the same ultimately what i'm saying when i do this is i don't have anything better to think about hmm hmm I wonder, one of my the convictions I was wrestling through tonight as you were preaching was this. When Jesus teaches us how to pray, he says, go into the closet and shut the door. Mm-hmm. What he means is, I think he very literally may mean go into a closet and shut the door. Well, they would take their prayer shawls and they would make a, it'd be like a cubicle. Because, you know, like you'd be in the temple, there'd be a bunch of people and you don't need to hear him and he doesn't need to hear you. So you're at, you're right, like, um, not isolate like in a bad way, but find solitude. Shut the door. That's it. Remove distraction. Correct. Remove distraction. And don't be a distraction to somebody else. Like it, this is a two way street. Mm. Remove it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shut this so I don't hear you. And don't be a distraction because I don't want to be a distraction to you. Like it's it's it goes both ways. Mm. So I really have been compelled to you know make sure in the practice of prayer that I'm not bringing in these devices or these things that can easily distract mm. even if I'm doing it for good reason to play my music or to what you know what I mean like they figured out another way or turn on figure out how to master that thing so that it doesn't distract you okay. that's one mm. so this might be too far uh I don't want to say that everybody else has to do this I think if if you don't spend time with the Lord beyond the point of boredom, you're not doing it right. And if somebody's like, oh, you're bored with the Lord, dude, if you read a little bit of like brain science on the things that happen in the human brain when the brain gets bored, and for all of written history, which would be like six, seven, 6,000 years ago, it's just been the last, it's been since 2007, where there's not significant portions of humans' day where they're bored. Mm-hmm. And... And it, things like create creativity and dreams and those kinds of things happen there. One of the reasons I just sit in the woods so much is that. Mm-hmm. No music. It's just me and the trees, man. Mm-hmm. You know? And it's amazing what happens when I'm, when I'm like, I'm not, I'm not actually wor- like, quote, unquote, working on the sermon, digging out verses and looking up stuff. The... Bible's down. I'm just sitting there, and I, and then just how do you explain it? And then you just had this. You haven't thought about anything for minutes, and then you're like, "This what hit me." You, the question: Are you trying to win the approval of God or man? You can't win either one. Mm-hmm. That did not happen in a hurry. That happened after a long time mm-hmm. of thinking about one verse to the point where I thought I'd thought all the thoughts about the verse, mm-hmm. and then and then. I don't know how the brain works. Mm-hmm. And a while later, I have a, a thought mm-hmm. that I built the whole sermon around. Mm-hmm. You can't win either. Mm-hmm. You receive the approval of God. Mm-hmm. So just act like it. And if you try to win the approval of man, it's fleeting. Mm-hmm. I think I cut you off. What was, there was like another thing to it. That was it. But thank you. Even experientially, like let's say a person says, I just can't get into it when I try to read my Bible or I try to pray. Like... If you ever tried to read something for a while, you know that it takes a minute before you like get into the state of like, okay, I'm in it. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of people don't know to push through that point either. You know, well, it's just like my pastor in college, um, he had his like Wednesday night class or something on how to pray. I went to it, and uh, so everybody's eighty, and I'm in there and like nineteen. I was a weirdo, and he, he would he would talk about memorized prayers as like a warm up. You know what I mean? So. From that day till now, even in my regular prayer time, even when I'm feeling the feels, I almost always quote the Lord's Prayer first. Mm-hmm. And two, 
I know this isn't how it works, but a little bit of me is like, okay, if I screw this up, I know that part will be right, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And But it does. It kind of gets yeah. me in the, like, the right prayer mindset to have a little bit of a warm-up. Um, yeah, I was talking to Reagan about reading her Bible. You know, I think I shared that text with yes. y'all. Yeah, it's so awesome. And I was like, all right, what's your favorite place? You got to get the right place. What's your favorite drink? What's your favorite time of day? Because... You're a psychosomatic, singular, unified being. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you don't necessarily feel all the feels in the moment, you'll get these like positive triggers. Mm -hmm. Like your body knows we're about to do time with the Lord because that's the seat I sit in and this is the time of day. And, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Paul, you, you, you mentioned this, Pastor Joby. Paul, you know, in my in my Bible, there's always a footnote when he says a servant. The word there is doulos. So what does, he says, if I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant, a doulos of Christ. What does that unpack? Um, well, I think the best translation is bond servant because mm -hmm. you pay for these people. Mm -hmm. One of the things we do need to say, when you hear the word slave, in America, this is different. Like the, the transatlantic race-based slavery is not what the New Testament is talking about. Right. It is pretty close to what Exodus is talking about when the when the Hebrew people were slaves in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And so, what God does is He sends Moses to let His people go. Mm -hmm. So, the Bible does not condone the buying and selling of humans, particularly race-based, violent, go get a group of people and treat them as less than human. That is not what the Bible is talking about. A bond servant is somebody that could pay off a debt with many, many years of labor mm -hmm. and uh, and willingly subject themselves to that, yeah. you know, and could buy themselves out of it at any point. Mm -hmm. But the idea of master is that. Mm -hmm. All of us are mastered by something. And here, Paul is saying, I'm not a master to my old way of life where I was still trying to please man by trying to c climb the corporate ladder of being the Pharisee of Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Now my master is Jesus Christ, so I do what he says, including having a really hard conversation with you because you're trying to add things to the gospel. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like me because of it, take it up with him. That's what he's saying. Hmm. So I do what he says. Hmm. I thought of I thought of Jesus's words. You were talking about, you know, why why are you trying to please these people? Have you ever heard that phrase? What's the phrase? You're spending money you don't have to buy stuff you don't need to impress people you don't like. You know, <laughs> it's like that's so dumb. Uh, and and you're talking about being free from all that. And I remember Jesus saying, "Hey, don't fear the people. All they can do is kill the body, right?" And that's obviously like more extreme than they just gave you a thumbs down or whatever social media. But um, fear the one who is able to, after you've died, decide your eternal destiny. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the perspective. Jesus is saying when you, and Paul's saying this, when you live to please or for the pleasure of one person, you are free to live in the joys of integrity, mm. an integrated life. And Paul's saying, I live for the pleasure of one person, mm. of one. And it's God the Father because of Jesus the Son. And Paul's able to say, one of the things that we've talked about many times in different relationships, Paul's able to say, truly say to people hard things, like he's saying to the Galatians, but he's also able to say incredibly encouraging things mm -hmm in the most free way possible, like, I love you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mean it, mm -hmm. but not, I love you. Will you please say, I love you back? <laughs> he's, he's able to say, I love you and mean that. Mm -hmm. That's freedom, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's able to say, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And truly say it from a place of gratitude, not thank you. Are you going to still like me? Be grateful. Mm -hmm. It's freedom. That's freedom. Mm -hmm. he, he's, he's able to say, I'm sorry. 
or I'm not good enough, or I'm the chief among sinners. He's able to be truly self-aware and to be truly apologetic in areas where he's been wrong, not to get you to think away about him, but from a sincere place of repentance and remorse that's godly and God-honoring. That's freedom. Mm. And the whole title of the series is Be Free. And if you want to be free, live, ask this question. Does my pleasing that person make God happy? Mm -hmm. I believe it makes God happy for me to singularly and joyfully serve my wife and desire for her to be happy. Mm -hmm. Not to feel a certain way about me, but for her joy and for his glory through me being a godly husband. I believe that makes God happy. I believe it makes God happy for me to forget, rid myself of myself as best as I can for the sake of someone else coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So pleasing them and living a life Mm. that would be honoring to them for the sake of them coming to Christ, that makes God happy. Mm. And so I think that's a great question. Does my pleasing this person make God happy? Mm. And if you can get those two things connected— Ultimately, the question is the pleasure of God. Mm, that's right. And in pleasing God, there are times where he will put us in positions that it brings him glory to make others happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the Piper line that we just heard a whole sermon about, um, that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That's that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. Like, yeah, he calls it Christian hedonism. Well, as, we, as we're getting ready to wrap up here, what practical wisdom could we offer the folks struggling with this? I mean, we talked a lot about social media, and it's funny because everybody gets that example because everybody's got a smartphone. Like, it's just like, he, so obviously none of us have thought the smartphone's so bad we should get rid of it because we all I, have one. I would say over the last 12 months, there have been, there have been more time over the last 12 months that social media has not been on my phone than has been on my phone. Mm. And I will also, and it's not because I was looking at something I wasn't supposed to look at. I was looking at things for too long. Mm. And there was, there was, there's been twice where I was like, all right, I'm going to bed in 20 minutes. You ever set these like arbitrary, the moment you start doing that, it's probably over. You know what I mean? (laughs) Um, like even if you're like, I'm not drinking on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, dude, you, you might have an issue. You know what I mean? So, and then it was like, all right, I'm going to bed at 11. It's like 1130 and I'm, I'm still watching, you know, whatever Jordan Peterson, like roast some BBC person. <laughs> and, and again, is there anything wrong with watching that? I don't think so. I was too long. And I was like, crap, this thing has a hold of me. Mm. So that was smoke for me. So I take it away. Mm-hmm. I think it's a good idea. And only you know this. Okay. Like when when you start to see a little sniff of smoke, I think it's a good idea to put a guardrail before that. Mm -hmm. So the thing that we've talked about it earlier, I don't ask the people, I have made it a practice to not ask the people that work for me what they thought about my sermon for that reason because I've done it, I have done it, and I think, what are you doing? What are you doing? There's something going on there. Mm -hmm. And so... I, so if you can just back it up a step and be like, well, just don't ask. Mm-hmm. So there's there's things like that. Mm-hmm. Anything come to mind for you? Comparison specific, not necessarily social media? Live in the woods? I don't know. <laughs> there's some things that don't read comments. Mm. Yeah. I, I have to do that. I mean, there's some stuff going on flying around right now, you know, and I got to just like put that stuff away. Mm-hmm. I think I would challenge everybody, you know, you can play the justifying game. You can play the, mm-hmm. well, it's just a hobby. It's just another, it's not that big a deal. You can do that. That's fine in regards to your relationship to your phone. And I can do it too. Mm-hmm. Uh, a challenge that I've felt and I would I would I offer to, to anybody listening is be really, really intentional to get bored mm-hmm. over the next couple of weeks regularly. Mm-hmm. Get bored regularly. And in that bored space, do whatever the good shepherd says. Mm. And so if you have a thought that comes to your mind and it's write an encouraging note to your spouse or it's uh, go clean this room in the house or mm. it's go sit down in that coworker's office and ask them how they're doing tomorrow mm-hmm. or it's go for a walk or do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
do that thing. Yeah. And let's just see how it goes. So try to get bored and do whatever whatever that impulse is that doesn't bring glory to you. Mm-hmm. Let's just maybe take a wild edge and assume it might be God speaking because mm-hmm. he does like to talk to his children and do whatever he says. Another thing, real quick, another thing that Chandler was talking about was from Hebrews 12 about the weight and the sin that clings to you. And I love the way he was unpacking how the weight could be just something that drains you to the point where you don't have the energy for the things of God. Yep. And so comparison or your phone, that might be like, imagine you're talking about your imagination and your mind earlier. There almost isn't a more powerful tool that we have for engaging with God. And just imagine this being sucked dry or just completely you know, frittered away, you know? So lay it aside. Pastor Joby, any closing words or a closing prayer? Yeah, I think Pastor Britt's advice is like the best. One of the things that we say all the time is the problem with adults is quit going to camp. And what makes camp great is you turn down the noise of the world so that you can tune your ear to the good shepherd. Mm-hmm. You don't have to wait until 1122 invites you on a retreat or hosts a thing for you to do that. You can create your own little camp mm-hmm. In your backyard or on a walk or whatever, you know. I mean, you know, most of us live at the beach, bro. Go, go take a walk, do that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, have you have you often heard the voice of God while you've been endlessly entertained? Mm-hmm. You know, no way, no way. Those those things are at odds with one another. Mm-hmm. Now, entertainment's fine, man. Watch a movie, right? Look at a couple, like set some real clear parameters. And, but make lots of time mm. for him. Mm. If you want to grow in him. If you don't, keep scrolling. And we're in it with you, man. We're we're all in the same fight with it, you know. Yeah. Cuz we're all our lives are all moving fast. Totally. We, you know. So that's one of the things I love about our church, man. We're all in it together. So, thank Yeah, you. so like if you're listening in the car, then when this thing's over, turn it off and don't turn another thing on. Mm-hmm. Just listen. You know, but you can make you you could you should be really wise with your days, mm-hmm. and there's some gaps in there where you could you could be traveling somewhere and you can create some moments where you can listen. Yeah, yeah. Let's pray, <clears throat> Father in heaven, uh, God. We're so overwhelmed that you would love us enough to give us your word, Jesus. We thank you for such a gracious offer mm-hmm. that if we are worn out. Mm-hmm especially from uh, living for the applause of man, that you invite us to come to you and you'll give us rest. You'll give us peace. You'll give us rest for our souls. That's what I pray Mm. for your children that would come to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the podcast. (laughs) The end. You nailed it.